Hey everyone, welcome to episode 9 of the So This Is My Why podcast. I'm your host and producer, Lingya, and today's guest is Ravi Chandramala, the founder of a social enterprise called Copa, which is based in Kathmandu, Nepal. Now, I first came to know and meet Ravi when I was in Kathmandu earlier this year, just before the country went into a lockdown due to COVID-19. Ravi operates a social enterprise and... In Ravi's own words, that is... Uh, social enterprise is a business in the sense that you have to sustain yourself as well, but not putting the money first. It's not only about the kolpa that's growing every day. It's also the life of the people you're working with. They should also grow along with you. And also without giving a negative impact to the society and the environment. Kolpa sells some of the most beautiful handicraft I have ever come across. Works of art made by indigenous communities all across Nepal, from the highest mountainous regions, accessible only by foot, down to the lush southern hilltops where straw mats and wild nettles originate. This is Ravi's story of why he chose to start a social enterprise, the processes and challenges he faced in the early days to be where they are today, the impact that Kolpa has made on the various Nepali communities, and his advice for others seeking to do the same. But before we begin, I'd love if you could head over to the Apple Podcast to leave a review. I love hearing back from my listeners and knowing how I can improve. And who knows, I might give you a shout out in the next episode. But until then, this is episode 9 of the So This Is My Why podcast with Ravi Mala. Are you ready? Let's go! Welcome to the So This Is My Why podcast, where we talk to people about their whys and how they turn them into realities to inspire you to live your best life. And here's your host, Ling Ya. Hi, Ravi. Thank you so much for agreeing to this interview. Thank you, Ling. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So I understand that you're currently based in Kathmandu, Nepal, and you are still in a form of lockdown, but you can start running your shops. So I was wondering if you could just give us a quick overview of what life has been so far for you. Well, um, in terms of uh, uh, the business, um, you know, we have been, the culpa has gone uh, uh, quite a bit of a change and uh, and uh, it's, it's a positive change, actually. And uh, so the first few like years has been a quite difficult, but uh, you know, difficulty happens, challenges happens all the time, especially in the social business like ours. But uh, uh, so far it's been going pretty well. And the lockdown, I mean, after the lockdown period has been over, like um, we got back into business like uh, two weeks ago. So two and a half weeks ago to be precise. And uh, things that w- isn't as uh, pre-COVID-19, but, uh, uh, but it's, it isn't that discouraging as well. So, I mean, um, so for a business like us and uh, what I've uh, uh, thought is like the people are being much more aware about um, being naturally aware and uh, thinking about the it. I mean, you know, people are more into a, a product that are produced in a very socially responsible way and a very ethical way and being one of those kind of business. So um, even after uh, COVID-19 or after, I mean, uh, after lockdown period, we haven't had that uh, the moment yet that, uh, you know, uh, that we need to worry about. So fingers crossed, hopefully we'll have this moment, I mean, in, in the new, uh, near future as well. Yeah. So, yeah. And I imagine your experiences in your life right now is very different from when you were growing up. I understand you were born in Bhaktapur and grew up in Kathmandu. So for people who have never been to the country before, can you give us an idea of what your childhood was like? Yeah, um, you know, I grew up in Bhaktapur. My parents, my, my father is an ex-police officer. And, uh, and I went to, that school was established for the uh, children of um, a police officer. Um, and ex-police officer and uh, so not eight years old I w- when I was 10 years old actually when I was 10 years old I went to 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 that police uh, police school um, so and uh, for eight years I just stayed in hostel and finished my uh, uh, grade 10 and uh, that part was more of how uh, that schooling period was more of like about being disciplined and you know everything was about the routine and uh, and 
so it and it was more about like being yourself responsible because um you know being in a hostel like uh, there's no one to take care of there's no parents like even if we, even if you are uh, uh it is or 10 years old 12 years old you have to do everything on your own you know there are certain things that your elders i mean your seniors will do it your teachers will do it but the rest is everything on your so that was more of a learning like from my um early childhood days and then i um, you know my i always wanted to be a medical doctor and uh and so i finishing my 10th grade i went to a college it's uh and um i started science there and um, biology was my uh, my interest and then um i finishing that but you know the things weren't that good <clears throat> and then um then i was like i realized uh, in nepal uh, you know there is one uh, you know the the medical profession in one side and but there was some other problem health issues as well and that was more of a mental health issues and i and that i realized like after after i started uh, um i i joined my uh, uh, bachelor in nepal uh, uh, maybe like um after i finished my 12th grade so that was like um in 1996 like you know i i joined my um, um bachelor of science and then uh, at the same time and you know i was doing my uh, uh, psychology classes as well because i realized like you know the mental health issue has been a big problem so and i wanted to pursue further in that so i i applied abroad to to study uh, clinical psychology in in us and uh so that was in 1998 yeah that was in 1998 then i moved out to us to 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 pursue my um further study in in psychology so and uh my childhood days were like um you know from it kind of changed from uh, being a medical doctor to you know slowly moved back to uh, being a uh, the clinical psychologist yeah And so was there any desire to be an entrepreneur or did you know anyone that influenced you to want to do that? Actually it's not. It, this is like um you know I just realized this when I uh, I came back to Nepal like after I finished my masters and uh uh cuz you know when I was in US I I stayed I stayed there for almost like um almost like 12 to 13 years and uh and uh, during those period and my information technology was my uh major uh, subject when i was uh, staying in new uh, us and uh, but every time i um, you know read the news about nepal there was always about like nepal being on a developed country not being able to uh, support themselves not having enough human resources and always relying on foreign funds and uh, and i was kind of like uh, um you know i uh, thought of like is is that so is that is it because of the education system that we have in nepal or is it just because we don't have enough people who could think of uh, um uh, having um enough knowledge to produce something within nepal you know is it always about like um um you know uh, getting something in in the form of like cash or in the form of like uh, uh, um, donations or or any kind of uh, um thing so i was like okay you know what if in if nepal needs some development if that nepal has to um go beyond the least developed country it has to produce its own thing and so then then i realized like after coming back from us after finishing my masters then i realized no we need to have a self sustainable economy otherwise we will be fully dependent on 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 on, on foreign countries or like foreign donations or foreign uh, um you know the um ingos and and foreign organizations that's not how the the country should run so i was like okay so i think the entrepreneurship is the one that will lead to that place yeah. you know then then i that was the uh, actually that was the eye opening thing like um, um, something that uh, uh nepal economy being dependent on the other countries that 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 has pushed me to become an entrepreneur actually So you yeah. were at the states for 12 years and clearly it impacted you a lot. I was wondering was it difficult for you in the initial days to assimilate to a culture that is so different from what you grew up in? In in US, yes actually it was uh, cuz uh, you know um, US was a completely even the language was a uh, even though I studied like all my life like 
uh, until I, I went to US was, uh, was on English, but uh, uh, the language, the accent and everything was uh, very different and even the culture was different. And uh, it was more, the uh, American society is much more open and the, but here, like, you know, I grew up in a hostel in, in police school for like almost eight years. And it was more about like being in a routine and in a very disciplined way. And I, which I couldn't, uh, uh, it was kind of like uh, very difficult to, to, to get, um, to blend it in. But, uh, but slowly, you know, and uh, um, slowly I realized like, you know, that is the actually, um, uh, the American society is more about like, being open to being open yourself like you know like you don't know how close you are how how in how what are the risks the restrictions that you will live uh, the living in the limitations you have when you are in nepal but over there is more of a like you know you do your own thing like you know you uh, everybody respects your thoughts and uh, and um, that was more of that and then um yeah and uh, the other part was uh you know uh, in us the first time when i went there in the big in the in the, in the um uh, first few months was like, you know, I didn't know how to drive. And then the driving was the must was must in, in, in us. And I had to take, uh, um, you know, help from my friends to go from one place to another. And the, and another part was, um, people hardly used to, I see uh, hardly people walking on the streets actually, you know, in, cause the, the place where I uh, went, uh, was Alabama and Alabama is like all the way to the South of, uh, um, it was a south southern part of uh, us and then um and only people i see walking was in the within the campus and the, like even when they have to go for a grocery or, or buying stuff to the market you know people hardly hardly walks and then and, um, and in nepal it was more of like you know you walk everywhere you go so you know that that and, and that time that was like almost like 20, 20 22 years ago we didn't have this much of a facility here in nepal like having a lots of transportations now like everybody has two wheelers at least like four wheelers or public transportation then was more of, of a, like doing everything by walking and uh, yeah yeah that that was some of the things that i found it a bit uh, uh, difficult but i think i got used to it and you know slowly uh, you start accepting things and uh, and uh, trying to be a part of that uh, society so yeah and I wanted to pick another thing you mentioned, which is that you wanted to go and do clinical psychology, but you ended up graduating with a bachelor's in IT. So what happened there? I know, you know, and uh, <clears throat> you know, we had a, the, the college when I, the, the, the university that where I went to study clinical psychology, uh, that college has a lot of other Nepali students as well. And, um, and in that period, that was in 1998. And um, during that period, you know, the, um, there was a kind of like slowly kind of um, the IT field, especially as a whole, like there was Yahoo. And that was a time like uh, the Netscape was there and uh, there was a Lycos, like Alta Vista was a search engine, you know, those kind of a thing. And, uh, and the, the Google was like, you know, it was in a very primitive form, you know, and uh, we haven't even heard about Amazon you know at that period and even when you learn about the word like you know how to uh, do, do things in the word or in excel like even if you know how to write a nice you know in a, in a um, uh, documents in a nice format you'd get a job right away that was the time and uh, when i went there and uh, you know a lot of nepali students there uh, some of my seniors like we have been uh, doing the masters because i was go i went there to to do my bachelor's and uh, some of them were already started uh, during the masters, they were like, you know, they were kind of surprised to hear me saying that I was there for a clinical psychology. And I was like, you know, being a Nepali, you know, I had to work and 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 earn and then have to pay. So that was the thing. And um, they were surprised, like, you know, what makes you think that, you know, that uh, uh, that you you could uh, uh, get a uh, the reward after uh, like your completing your psychology thing you know psychology to get a job in psychology it's pretty hard and especially after doing a bachelor bachelor those four years are like kind of critical especially in 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 u.s as of so to to get a nice job or to have a, a career you have to finish your masters that's like another three more years so you have to struggle for seven long years but till until you finish your masters how are you gonna you know support yourself like financially and then and I was like, actually, he was right because, you know, they have they have already had the experience, uh, you know, they have already uh, done their bachelor's and they're going through the master's. So they have the experience and being a, a student from Nepal, they were like um, kind of like 
making me aware of like you know rethink your uh, um you know your 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 uh, your ambition and then i was like okay i don't know what to do you know being i have a science background i i was good at math and physics and uh, so i was like uh, so what's the go for an it and i was like you know that was a because of wasn't my interest but uh, um uh, you know the because of the time and situation then so and i switched uh, uh, to it yeah that so you graduate so you finish your bachelor's in 2020- 05, and then you decided to come yeah. back. Did you have any clear plans on what you were going to do when you came back? Yeah, actually, what I thought was like, uh, even in 20, 2005, uh, um, you know, Nepal was kind of slowly getting into a bit of knowledge about the, uh, the information technology, and there were not that many businesses here. E commerce wasn't there here in Nepal. So I was thinking of uh, starting, have, starting my own uh, IT company here in Nepal. That was my thoughts. And um, during that period, we have already thought about having a, a you know, uh, the internet service provider. That was my thing that time. And uh, in US, like we didn't have, we didn't used to even have a cable then. There used to be a DSL, like, you know, there was a Verizon who was um, uh, providing the high-speed internet service through uh, uh, through the telephone line. And, uh, and we, in Nepal, we used to have a lot of those uh, uh, landlines you know, in, in each and every household. Right now, they have a mobile. But at, at that period, like most of them has a, uh, the phone connection, land, you know, the landline connection. So we're thinking of providing an internet service through that. And that was my intention, actually. You know, we, we are, I have a friends in New York, like uh, um, uh, we're my classmates, we're my colleagues there. And, uh, and we kind of wanted to work that out, but uh, um, it didn't work out that well. So that was my intention. So, so it's just to start up some IT company and, and move forward. And how do you pivot into the first iteration of Copa, which was Copa Traders? How yeah. do you end up there? Actually, uh, yeah, right after 2005, like, you know, I thought of, uh, um, I have to do something for, for this, uh, for Nepal. And uh, when I thought like, you know, IT company isn't possible then. And then uh, I thought of, so um, of promoting some Nepali products abroad. And uh, I have a bit of a background in, in, in web designing and, you know, in, in graphic designing and stuff. And, you know, I used to do things on my own, even when I was in New York. I have that, I have that passion with me. And uh, then I thought of uh, um, uh, supporting the uh, Nepali handicrafts by selling it abroad, especially the market was U.S. because that's, that's where I, um, you know, that's where... I know a lot about that. So, and the, I, I stayed in New York and uh, there were a lot of Nepali communities there and, uh, and uh, many people, whoever I met in New York, especially Americans, and they always appreciate the way we, our culture is and their arts and crafts. And so I was like, you know, I thought of like, okay, maybe uh, it has some market there. So, and um, to do, to export things from Nepal to foreign countries, you have to have a registered company. So then I registered Kolpa Traders as, a, as an exporting company for, for handicrafts. And during that, uh, that period, uh, when I first registered in 2000, and I think it was 2006 or seven, yeah, 2006, yeah, I think, yeah, 62 Nepali means uh, 12 years ago. So, uh, uh, just 2007, uh, it was not, not about the production it was more of a, a um, exporting of Nepali handicrafts. So, and uh, that's how I started the Kolpa Traders. Is there a to, reason to behind? Is there yes. a reason behind the name Kolpa? Yes, actually, uh, Kolpa is kind of uh, it has a personal um, uh, connections to my to my life, and because uh, the place where I was born, uh, where, where I was uh, born is a uh, its name is Kolpa Court, and. Uh, and so, and uh, uh, that is a very, um, it's a historic place. And, uh, you know, and that, that name has been slowly kind of like uh, um, disappearing and because uh, that place got a new name, you know. So it has a new, it has a new name called Tokel. That's everybody now, nowadays uh, know that that place, that Kolpa Kot. Uh, by uh, by a new name, Tokel. So, but I always had that when I grew up, like, you know, if I have to, if somebody asks me where I'm from, I always used to say Kolpakot, because Jokil used to be a very difficult for me to, to say it, because it is so, so, and uh, when I came back from US, and then I realized, like, you know, maybe um, Kolpa is like, you know, that is the, 
that's the place I think I, I have to, um, I don't want that name to be forgotten, you know? So, and, um, and so instead of a uh, Kolpa code having those, I, I just took the last uh, code out and then uh, bring Kolpa as a, as, as a, as a, as a brand. And, and also kind of like the, the, the thing that I work with um, kind of relates with the name because uh, um, you know, just like a name, like I don't want that the, uh, to be forgotten that there are some, so many traditional skills here in Nepal, like which is kind of slowly kind of like disappearing. The, the artisans are, uh, um, you know, are, aren't, uh, um, encouraged and um, they, they don't see any market in it and they don't see like you know they, they are doing this just as a hobby or like you know just as a you know if they need it like if they need it they will do it if not like you know they don't bother so but to those kind of uh, uh, artisans and, and the craftspersons you know I think uh, um, you know I have to go and encourage them inspires them and, and not let that skills die you know so and then uh, it's a, it's kind of like related with kolpa so i don't want those skills and traditions and uh, to be forgotten that culture to be forgotten so uh, this name and the uh, the work i do kind of like, like relate to each other and uh, yeah so that's how the um, kolpa name got and, and 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 the philosophy behind it and I imagine that like at the time, they probably weren't a lot of people doing what you were doing. So it would have been quite hard to explain to the locals what you were trying to achieve. So was it quite difficult in those early days to try and connect with these people and get your business going because you end up leaving Nepal soon after that? So I wanted to know um, in those early days, was it difficult for you to run your business? And what led to you eventually leaving Nepal again to go back to the States? Uh, that time, uh, you know, it was more of a, uh, I was a freshly graduated um, IT student and uh, I've seen a lot of scope there in the US and I wanted to do the same thing here in Nepal. And uh, that time it was in 2000 and, um, 2005, 2006. And uh, that period is Nepal is kind of like, it's a very critical situation then. Um, there was a civil war happening and uh, there was, uh, um, you know, there was not a, there was a mistrust even among Nepalese here. And uh, uh, we, ne we have never had a, a, um, a moment in history that uh, the Nepalese fighting with Nepalese, you know, to, to, to get the rights. So, and uh, that time, like everybody were kind of in a very scary situation. Nobody trusted one another. And even like, you know, the, um, and the business environment wasn't good. And uh, so, and so, even uh, there were lots of strike happening here, and there was like a, a vehicle strikes there, and uh, that's what we call the Nepal Banda. Like everything would be shut down; not even a single story will see, like you know, opening. Like when there is a Nepal Banda, it's a Nepal like you know closure of Nepal. That's done. That they used to do it by a political parties, you know everything will be shut down no one is allowed to run the business so, so that was the time you know that was this was the situation then and uh, uh so nobody knows where that uh, political situation leads the country to so it was very fragile environment then and uh, for me to start a business and you know was it was difficult just to get a one liter of petrol like i have to go to like uh, almost like 30 hours of you know uh, riding so that was the moment then so, and um, it wasn't that favorable. So I kind of like, you know, kind of like um, hold my uh, ideas to start things here in Nepal. So that's why I started Kolpa Traders so that I could do something so that I can export the things that we have here in Nepal to broad countries. So yeah. that was the thing. It was quite very difficult then, yeah. yeah. So you moved to the States and you end up doing a master's in IT. So why didn't you do something that was business related since you were already running a business? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I wasn't uh, really, to be honest with you, you know, I'm not a very a business person. I still have a, I always have that, you know, my childhood uh, um, thoughts of uh, giving, uh, giving service to people. That was always behind my head. And uh, even for me, even now, the business doesn't mean like making 
you know, generating a revenue now to me. It's, it is not about generating like, you know, uh, having a lots of turnover and, and making a tons of profit or being a millionaire. That, that this is still not my, my objective. So I will, I also, so business is not my thing. It was more of a service, but in a very sustainable way. So even when I went there and you know, the IT has been my, uh, uh, um, my field for last, you know, the few years. So I thought like it would be much more easy for me to pursue, uh, uh, you know, to, to continue that, uh, that subject matter, even when I'm doing my master's. So I never thought of doing business then. Yeah. Right. And then you eventually moved back in 2011 with your wife and two daughters. Was that yes. a difficult transition for you guys? Yeah, it was actually, especially because, uh, especially for me, because you know I stayed in uh, uh, um, the US for like so many years, and um, but you know, uh, and there is the facility that I uh, uh, that we used to have um, in US. We can't compare this the one here in Nepal, and Nepal is going. Nepal was going through a lot of uh, difficulties then, especially it was more about the electricity. You know, we used to have a like a 16 hours of a blackout you know, every day, or like at least the average was like 12 hours every day. Imagine running a business with uh, 12 hours blackout every day. So, yeah, and uh, so it is it's quite, it was tough time, but, uh, uh, but you know, how we, what we decided in me and my wife, she's very, uh, uh, um, she's always been with me and uh, we always, um, the, whatever we do, whatever we decide, like, you know, we, it's always something, good for us and as well as for the others as well she has been very supportive to me and then but we decided like you know uh if i had to work like uh, uh 12 hours here in us why can't we do give them give the same time and effort in in nepal at least like in in us like you know there will be someone to call uh, to replace me you know they have a lots of uh, uh people um, looking for a job but in in the context of nepal you know if you if someone with an energy if, if, if that place is vacant, you, it's very hard, difficult to find, to replace that place here in Nepal. So what we thought is like, okay, let's go back to Nepal and see how we, what we can do. You know, if, we, if we're gonna give that much of effort and time here in Nepal, at least something will come out of it. You know, something productive, something positive will come out of it. So, and it was a, a difficult situation, but actually we did it and um, there's no regret. So you moved back. Do you know exactly what you were going to do? Uh, that time, actually, I didn't know. I didn't know. I know that I'm going to do something for the community that I know, but I don't know how. I don't know which path I'm going to take. Because uh, that time, my uh, little one, uh, my, my youngest daughter was uh, just one years old. And um, to someone, me or my wife, someone has to take care of her. And uh, but you know, uh, both of us staying home is not gonna uh, uh, be, you know, that's not, that shouldn't be a, our plan. So we thought of like, someone needs to work, someone has to start uh, uh, doing a job. So my wife, uh, um, she's very passionate of environment and uh, she's more of like an uh, activist. And uh, so she was like, okay, you know what? Um, uh, she has done a quite a, a nice job here in Nepal before she, came she came to us so she started so i i you know i asked her to so just go for a job and then i will until you know i, I will just wait for a few more months or few few more years to decide uh, my um, my profession or like my what i'm planning to do so uh, when she started working i stayed home with my uh, daughters you know and uh, she was just one years old and uh, when slowly like um during that period and i started brainstorming things and i started meeting people i started seeing things nepal from a very different way i haven't seen before and so back then in when i was newest the only thing i used to get the news from nepal is through online media or, or through news but when i when i when i came back here in uh, nepal I, I i get to see them i get to see them i get to meet them in person so and uh yeah so I didn't have any idea what to do, like when I first came in. Actually, yeah. it was uh, uh, the work I'm doing right now is the um, is result of the of the first few years of my uh, staying home and uh, staying home with my kids and and learning about Nepal. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I wonder before we go into that business side, I mean, like you were staying at home. Is that something that is normal in the Nepali society? Because from what I read, like normally the men would go out and work and the women would stay at home. So was that a difficult thing socially, culturally? Yeah. But you know, uh, I don't know. I haven't heard anyone telling me like, you know, you can't be, you can't stay home or like you can't do nothing and, 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 and take care of kids. Cause, uh, um, you know, uh, when you have a, when you have a uh, children, you know, it's, it's a responsibility of, 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 of both parents to, to give more time to the, to the children. So, and, and, and uh, being a partner, you know, you have to be supportive no matter how difficult the moment is or, or no matter how, you know, how the other partner is going, you know, wanting to do things. So you have to support them. So, and um, my uh, wife is like, uh, she really needs, uh, wanted to work, especially on environment field. So what she realizes is like, you know, if she gonna, um, gonna stay home here and then started looking for kids, you know, she will lose those first, you know, the, the period of like the time. So she has that energy, you know, and, and I don't want that energy to just to get you know, just sitting out at home and, and, and being a housewife. That's not what I wanted to do. You know, what I don't want to have uh, that. So, and I asked, I, I asked her, you know, uh, and that she was really into it. And she even, I said, no, I need to work. You know, I need to work. If I don't do it now, it's going to be too late. So that's what the end. And I said, okay, go ahead. That's a very great, I mean, like whatever we decide then was a, I mean, was the right decision that we make and uh, for me being with my with kids was um at first like you know people kind of like um only you will see like uh, uh women uh taking care of kids i mean that's our uh, traditional society but to me it was uh, uh, i don't know why um, uh, but nobody dared to like you know question me that time because uh, i always tell them even now like um, um people ask me like how, how many children we have and then I always said, said to them, I have two daughters and uh, they still question me like, hey, you don't have a son, you know? So we still have that, that, that kind of, okay, you know, son should, you should have a son at least kind of like, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's still a kind of, it's kind of changing, but it's still a male dominated society. And I said, no, look here, two daughters are my two sons, you know, that's what I says, you know, I mean, there's nothing my daughters can't do. That's what I, what I tell them now, you know, whatever your son can do, my daughter can do the same thing, maybe better than that. You know, that's how I, so, and, um, but uh, um, people questions me sometimes, but I don't take, take that seriously. You know, when you have a kid, it's, it's responsible of the, both of the, both, of your, both parents to, to take care and, and, and give them a, a um, you know, you have to give them your full time and, and, and support. And yeah. 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 And I think people don't realize that looking after kids is a full time job, sometimes harder than having an actual job. So during that time, you're looking after your kids. I, you mentioned it briefly, you were spending your years researching, reaching out to people, creating that foundation for what Copa is today. And I was wondering, like, how did you even begin to do your research to understand and reach out and talk to these people while handling your kids at the same time? Yeah, and because, uh, um, um, like, after uh, um, after eighteen months, when my little one got eighteen months, when she um, was eighteen months years old, one and a half years old, and uh, she's, we uh, she started going to preschool, like you know, in the nursery, just just for a, like you know, it was on to school, but it was more of a spending time, you know, with the other kids, and uh, so I have a bit more time in uh, during the day, like you know, so when when both of my kids were in the school, so during those period, you know, I used to. Uh, roam around Kathmandu like whenever there is a um, um, exhibition happening or any any fairs that's going on you know I used to go there and participate I used to talk to them I used to ask them different questions uh, their uh, their life you know their, their works and stuff so that was the moment that I started doing a bit more research on it yeah, yeah. so when they went to school and then uh, and and then I used to go to uh, to producers who are doing those things you know, meeting them, seeing them working. Yeah. And so that was all between in between, like, you know, uh, uh, in the morning and, and the, uh, the time before I, uh, the kids come back from school. Yeah. Those, those period. And what was your main takeaway during all those research? 
hours spent talking to people. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, this is where I. Uh, what I realized is like uh, um, Nepal is very rich in natural resources, you know, and uh, and we have a, such a wonderful, skillful people here in Nepal. And um, it's not only for. It's not those. Those peoples are here not only in Kathmandu Valley, not in the cities only. Most of them actually are living in a remote region of Nepal. That's what I uh, found. And uh, so, and the many people who have who are doing these things have been doing this for like decades. And the thing is the, uh, the result that they were expecting wasn't up to their uh, uh, the need actually. That's what I realized. And then, uh, and uh, people don't appreciate, like the, the people especially, don't appreciate their craft as well, you know? And uh, they take it, they were taking everything for granted, and uh, uh, just because they were coming from a, a remote part of Nepal, doesn't mean that you know they lack those skills, you know. And the people think uh, like you know the natural resources just comes for free, and those skills are just a um, you know it's just a part time thing, you know. I mean, people they're just making they're just making these things as a as a, like just to kill their time. That's how they were taking these things. And I was like, that's not how it should go. And then that's what I found. Like, you know, Nepal is rich in natural resources. We have like, exceptional skills here. And if those skills can be uh, um, uh, modified or like, you know, uh, uh, or, or give them a bit more uh, value to it or, or, or um, tease them, the auditions, to make things that can be marketable or that is in demand you know we can at least uh, um somehow uplift their their financial situations that's what i realized and another thing is um nepal is not the market that we need to sell those things here people here like bargains a lot you know so really we do have a lot of bargaining going on and uh even in a handmade products, people bargain the same way as the manufactured, like the, you know, the imported products that's made by machines. And uh, for me, that shouldn't be the case, you know? And uh, so that's what I realized in, in those research years. And, uh, and what I thought is like, okay, whenever, if I, if I brush it, Father, or if I start my business, whenever I work with communities, the products that I'm going to make, I'm not going to sell here in Nepal. I'm going to sell it abroad where it will be appreciated. That was my thoughts, yeah. So at what point do you decide that you were ready to take all that research and bring it into flotation? That was uh, um, when I started, like, uh, um, um, when my, uh, um, you know, after a lot of research now, the, um, you know, I talk to many artisans and many producers and uh, I feel them like very hopeless. And then I was like, you know, someone needs to step in and needs to act, you know. Um, so I was like, okay, I think uh, I shouldn't wait anymore. So what I thought is like, okay, I need to develop my website first. I need to be, a, a, I need to reflect their work <laughs> to the to, to the people abroad and that the best way, best way to go is like I have to have my own own websites and then another thing is like my the kids have already grown up and they're a bit more uh, uh, you know now they are slowly kind of like understanding things and uh, I, I'm getting a bit more uh, relaxed from from that side as well and then in, um, my wife is also kind of like a bit more, you know, she has already got used to the life here. So, and um, so, and then, then I realized like, you know, I think we need to, um, I need to take, I need to lift this off. Yeah, and that was in 2014 that I started developing my own, own websites. And then, yes, and uh, yeah, uh, that period I started. Into it. So you started with your website and what was the reaction? Was it? Yeah, it was. Um, I wasn't expecting, like you know, because um, it took a while for me uh, uh, to start this. Because uh, um, being an IT person, you know, and uh, have a bit more an interest in graphic designing and stuff, I did everything on my own, taking photographs, writing contents, 
and uh, you know uh, fixing everything that the web needs <clears throat> and um, and it was uh, um, at first like I was also quite active in social media and uh, um, and the many people started uh, recognizing and like you know hey who is this like out of nowhere the, there's a brand called cold by and it's selling Nepali products and and they have also a very you know fine looking websites and there's been a like a bit of conversations happening around i didn't realize that you know it was already happening behind me and like people have already started uh, 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 noticing us and uh, and yeah people appreciate it and especially um, um, you know material that we are working on and uh, was very new to uh, to many people around here and uh, most of the people even uh, they don't even think like you know those things are made here in Nepal. They were thinking like, like we import materials from abroad and then in a, uh, do things here, but that is not the case. And uh, which is actually uh, you know, which is um, for me, I'll take that as a compliment, because because uh, uh, we never have we ne we have never produced that fine products here in Nepal, and uh, and so and the people thinking like uh, um, those things can are being produced here in Nepal, like is and I take that as comment. It is a, it was a good, very positive feedback that we received. Yeah. So you managed to get that interest overseas with amazing looking products as well. So what kind of products were you selling then? Who were the first community you worked with? Company actually uh, the first uh, uh, you know we started with a uh, uh, cotton bags actually cotton tote bags and because uh, um, 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 being as I uh, told you I'm not a business person I don't know much about like like, you know, uh, taking risk in, in investment and stuff. And so uh, so just to be on the safe side, I started from um, uh, making cotton bags because uh, so that I could understand the business environment here in Nepal, the, 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 the production, uh, uh, the process and everything like the, the exporting and all those things, you know, because I didn't know I didn't I didn't have any any uh, friends or a family who are already doing this, who could who could uh, um, guide me through the process, everything like that is happening is, uh, uh, is, is I'm doing on my own. That's how I'm learning. So I started with a, with a, with a cotton uh, bags and uh, with a very different designs. It was a very uh, uh, modern and contemporary designs that I, I, I had it, I had on. And um, so, um, and the people, uh, what I wanted was uh, all the per, all the things that I made needs to be made in Nepal here. It has to do the raw materials and the skills. Everything should be Nepali, but the product should satisfy the global customers. You know, it has to be uh, uh, appealing to the mass. It shouldn't be to a certain community, or it shouldn't be to a shouldn't have a limitation limitation that's 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 how i was feeling and uh, that's how i'm going that that was my first thought so even having a cotton bag um I made in nepal and I, I made you know with a with a very uh, contemporary design and 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 trendy looking uh, uh, um, print on it and wanted to satisfy the people from a, uh, like from all walks of life from all all, all over the, um, uh, the world that was my uh, goal and uh but you know, internet isn't a. Uh, um, it's it's a. It isn't easy to 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 sell yourself in this in this and in this huge and huge marketplace here. You know, you were just uh, what I thought is like I'm just a drop in the ocean. That's how I felt in the beginning. And um, but uh, um, my customers and my customers, my client, it was not restricted or not limited to a certain boundaries or group or a community it was more for the world yeah yeah and which was the first community you end up working with um at first uh you know i started with a uh, newar community here and in, in the in kirtipur because uh, um what i wanted like and my i have some criteria that i have uh, placed um especially in the production process you know my uh, my first criteria was, um, you know, I always wanted to produce or make things first from uh, physically challenged people, if it's possible, you know, if it's possible, like someone who is deaf or someone, 
you know, who are on a, uh, who can't move or like what de- I mean, the, uh, like who can't speak, right? Those kind of people who are having a, who are physically challenged. If if my products can be made by these people, I I, I prefer to work with them first because they are the one who are you know kind of like forgotten in this uh, you know you know in this in the process of of like a, um, development actually you know so I want those people to be self sustained you know they, I want them to be self dependent you know I don't want so so the, I, I want them to earn something. That was my first criteria, and if not, then I would go for uh, um, the women's, like you know, financially challenged women, and and then if not, then I only I I'll go with like you know the um, the regular people. That was my this was my criteria, and at first I tried to I I, I followed the, even when making these uh, cotton bags in the beginning I followed this, this process. I first went to a, a one of the. Um, uh, organizations like who is uh, supporting deaf people there you know I try to I, I, I give them sample you know I ask them to make me a sample of it but you know there's a limitations of they, they have their own limitations and I couldn't get the, the result so I moved to, to a, a, a you know a financially and, and, and uh, um, challenged the people especially women's and I went there to few cooperatives and there were some other uh, from outskirts of Kathmandu, some to a nearby village. I went there. You know, they know how to stitch. They know how to do things. They have the uh, uh, the sewing machine, and uh, I tried to you know work with them, but it didn't work out as well. You know, so so I was I felt so bad, and then and, um, and then I went to a one community in Kirtipur. It's a family run business, and then I went and I. Uh, approached them and they came, I mean, the, the product were fantastic. It was beyond my expectations. And those, all those cotton tote bags that we have made in the, in the first few years are made by that community. It's a newer community. And was it yeah. hard to communicate with them and gain their trust? Yes, actually. Cause uh, you know, even uh, being a startup, you know, I don't, I can't invest much in it, in it as well. I have my own limitations, I have my own restrictions, like in terms of capital, in terms of uh, um, the market, you know, I was a startup, not, not many people know about it. And I can't guarantee like how many pieces I would be able to sell this. So, and um, you know, but uh, they were, they were nice. They were very cooperative. And uh, um, so, and uh, at, it was a bit difficult, but they didn't mind. You know, so and uh, when they saw my websites and then uh, they realized like, you know, so it's not only about today, it's not only about a month or so, you know, it's the Kolpa is not about like certain uh, um, uh, goal oriented business. It's more about a long term one. So, yeah, so we're, so uh, it was a bit difficult at first, but slowly. Yeah. So uh, we moved forward. Yeah, it, it, we didn't have a problem after that. And I remember when we talked the last time, you mentioned there was this Daru community in Tarai. Yes. And yes. they are the ones who produce the straw mats. Could you tell yeah. us the story of how you got to know them, create that bond and trust? Yeah, you know, during my research days, like when I was taking care of my kids, those are from 2011 to 2014, <clears throat> that was the time actually uh, I met one of the lady. You know, she was from, from Tarai. She was a Daru lady. And there was one fair happening here. And uh, and I I saw her floor mat and then asked her the price of it and then uh, you know it was uh, actually I I went to that fair like twice once in the first day in the beginning and one at the end and the first at the first fair uh, first day you know she was selling it I was just going around looking around the things that they have in that fair and then and I asked the price there that of the mat but I didn't buy it. And uh, the last day I went there and uh, she was so desperate to sell those mats because, you know, um, she's from a far south. And then uh, if, she, if she couldn't sell those mats, she has to take it back home. And, you know, taking, you know, bringing, bringing from her village to, to Kathmandu to sell and uh, she hasn't been able and not being able to sell is like kind of like, it's, it's, it's almost like a failure, you know, like, you know, you failed you because you have promised your, uh, um, the people from that village that you know i'll be you know i'll bring cash with me when i come back but the thing is like she hasn't been able to sell that and i was like okay you know what 
and the shoe was selling in a very low price. And I was like, how long? And I asked him, why this price? Like how, how long will, will, it, will this mat yeah. uh, to take the, the time it takes? And then she was like, okay, this will take a certain number of days. And I was like, and, but you are not even getting a one day uh, ways could you give selling us, in that price. Could you give us yeah, numbers? Yeah, like yeah, exactly. It's a, uh, you know, she was selling that, uh, she was selling it for 2000 in the, in the beginning, in the first day. And now she's ready to reduce the price to 1200. Which is around you know? like $12 for one mat. Yeah, $12 for it. And how, I mean, like long, 12, how long was it? How long was it yeah, yeah, taking it them will, to make it? Will it? Take, it will take at least like four days. Yeah, yeah, at least like four days, let's say. Like if you work, like if you, if you just started like doing that, it will take at least like four days to do that. And then, and I, and I was surprised, like when I, when I break down the, the selling price with the number of days, like they're not even like, you know, getting like the lowest of the lowest ways. And I was like, oh, this is not gonna work, you know? And I asked her the contact number, you know, and then and, um, I told her then, you know, I bought some of them before you leave just leave it to your uh like she's staying at her one of her relatives place and i asked her to leave those mats there and you know i'm gonna contact you later and then uh, I, I took her number and i asked uh, and then we started i started communicating that's how it gone you know from, and i think you end I'm up there. you end up meeting yes. them in their village as well and getting to know them right? Ex exactly i went there twice already you know it's been a it's been like, yeah like we have a very good uh, relationship now and at first, like it was only her because uh, she she is young and uh, she's maybe like that that time she was just maybe like around uh, seventeen or eighteen years old um, young lady, like and uh, she could read and write and she could communicate, uh, but uh, but the uh, the other weavers, uh, whoever used to uh, weave those straw mats, those those grass mats, uh, weren't educated and especially. Um, uh, they were much older and um, you know they couldn't read and write and so it was difficult for others to come to the city and and and, and communicate with, uh, with with customers but she was she was just uh, she had just passed her um, you know high school and uh, she was a bit more energetic and uh, she was the only one she was the chosen one let's say to 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 come to the Kathmandu um, and uh, and I went to her um, uh, and then yeah it was it was a pretty uh, pretty interesting yeah meeting with everyone and uh, we even took a small training um to that community and uh yeah things are going pretty well yeah and was everyone initially very like welcoming to someone they had never met before let me yeah uh the first time i went there it was just for all like you know uh, let's go and see how things are there kind of thing and i didn't stay long that long i just um, I went to that met uh, met the lady and and her family and then went and uh, through the village and see how things work and uh, i just stayed there for maybe like 45 minutes an hour or so and the next time and i i, I told them i'm going to come back but i'm going to come back with a blast you know so and the next time when I went there, I took uh, uh, we had a um, we had a trainer actually. You know, I took a uh, I took a trainer here, and uh, one of the organization was kind of supporting the trainer, and uh, I went with her and um, and like I stayed there for almost like a week, more than a week there. I communicated with them and everybody. Uh, the first time I still remember. Let me just give you one one uh, one um, you know. Um, um, the period that what happened then the second time I went there you know I talked to the lady and uh, uh, her name is Santi the one who I met here in the fair and she's the one she coordinates everything because uh, she can she can you know she can use Facebook she can uh, send me text messages and everything because we need someone like her you know from that community and I talked to her, I told her that, you know, I'll be coming in certain um, uh, this time of the year. And uh, if anyone is interested to learn something new, you know, uh, um, please let them know. And then, uh, uh, <clears throat> and then, uh, well, she said, okay, yeah, I'll talk to my uh, people. I'll talk to everyone. So let's see who are interested. And then she goes like, uh, okay, yeah, people are interested, but uh, um, what are we going to get? You know? Besides learning something new, what are we gonna get? 
is there any like uh, um, incentives that we're going to get? Are we going to get money from it? Like the, for the, during training period, you know, what here in Nepal, because of NGOs and INGOs, what they used to do was like, um, if you be a part of a training, it's not only about the learning thing, you know, they will give you extra money for it, you know? So that uh, the reason is like, you know, NGO and I, NGOs, what they want is the number. They want to see the group of people. They want to have a, a people, number of people that could fit in their camera lens, you know? So this is kind of, the more the people, you know, uh, the, what they think is that the successful is the training. It's not about like what they learn, what the people learn. It was more about the number of people. So, and uh, they, have, they are already used to this kind of, uh, uh, Thing and then she was asking me like if they're gonna get any any money out of it or and I said no, you know, like someone is coming all the way from Netherlands to share their skills and try to you know uh, teach you something, and uh, and uh, you're asking money instead of that. Actually, you guys are supposed to you know you guys are the one who needs to pay her. You know, it's not her paying you, but the tradition here in Nepal is the, is the approach. It, you know. And what was, what was their reaction to that? And then, well, and she goes like, well, I, I'll let them know, you know, I'll let them know whatever you said. And then she goes like, okay, just tell them, you know, we don't have anything that we can offer besides skills. You know, don't think about the uh, only like um, um, seven days or, or 10 days of training. Think about seven years and 10 years after the training. That's what I told her. And then uh, she came to me and said, yeah, if you are interested, maybe I, what I felt is like, she couldn't say no to, to me, right? That's how I felt. And uh, she must have uh, told her uh, uh, near ones, especially very close ones to come and be a part of the training. That's how I felt, you know? And so, and then, okay, then the, okay, we'll be coming then. Okay, no, no. I said, no worries. I don't have a problem. Even there are like, five people that's fine maybe three people is also okay i don't need 30 people i don't need 20 people you know so whatever is the number i don't have a problem but we're gonna come up with something very beautiful during that training so that the whoever aren't the part of that training will at least you know they will kind of like feel okay you know what we missed that we wanted to bring that kind of thing okay so and uh we went there and um uh the next morning we went to the community and it was, uh, uh, it was in one of the uh, small cottage like house, it's a Tharu house. And then when we went there, like so many women started joining there and the whole, like the room was full. I wasn't expecting it. It was like 25 people, 25 or 26 people there. And it was, uh, uh, I think it was July and it's quite hot in here. And just, uh, we just couldn't handle it. It was warm. And especially the lady from Netherlands, you know, the trainer who was coming here and like she was sweating. She's, and uh, it, was, it was quite difficult for everyone to, to, to tolerate that. But nobody was complaining, you know. Everybody was like, wow. And then the, um, and uh, we have some discussion, you know, I gave them, okay, so happy to see you. You know, there were like so many men and women both. And they were there and I told them what, uh, what, should, what should they expect from this training and what are our objectives. And I, I, told, I explained to them about the trainings and what are you going to do, what, what are the products that we're going to come up with and what will happen after that training. And so everybody is like, kind of like, okay, you know what? I don't think like, uh, um, uh, we, uh, they must have realized like uh, they have made a good decision you know, coming to that training. And so next day, what happened is like the, uh, the lady next to the, uh, the cottage that where we are doing that the first day, and she had a very nice house, you know, across the street. And uh, it was much cooler and it was made from cement and brick and she had a fan and stuff, right? And the, she offered us the place, the room where we could work on for next, uh, you know, the, uh, for the training period. It was quite, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was quite um, uh, interesting and uh, I was, was yeah, everybody seems like, oh yeah, uh, we felt like very successful, but yeah. So I wanted to pick up something that you said that was very interesting. You said 
when you asked her to find if anyone was interested in this training, she felt like she couldn't say no. Why did she yes. feel that way? Do Why do I feel that way? Because uh, sometimes what happens is like, you know, it's um, how we feel. That's, the, that's what I learned here. Like being a Nepali, people can't say no here, to be honest with you. They just can't say no. If you can't do it, just say no. In business, that, that's what I tell everyone now. Everyone, like even when in the, when I'm working with so many, so many, like, you know, with communities, I always say them, you have to speak very openly. There, you shouldn't keep anything within you. That's what I tell. If you can't do it, just say, no, I can't do it. I have this problem or I, you know, I have, uh, I'm already committed to doing things on that day or, 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 or with, you know, with, I have a family commitment or I have a, uh, or, or something, you know, that you can't like, and the Nepalese people just can't say no. Is it because they're that scared of offending people? Or <clears throat> I, I guess, I guess like, uh, that's how we are grow up. I mean, that's how we are, you know, taught. And that's, I think it's a part of the culture or, you know, they will just stay quiet, but they just can't say no. And so, so and uh, they will always like you know agree on things that they can't do and that's that is and i always tell them please don't do that do not agree the, in the things that you won't be able to so i think that's how i realized you know i don't know if that if, if i understood her uh, correctly or not but that's how i that's how i realized like um because um, we have been working uh, with that community for a uh, um, few months already and so, and uh, so she might have felt like, okay, you know what? I mean, um, I don't think whatever he's saying is something wrong. It's not gonna do something bad to, to us. He's doing good for us. And, uh, uh, but the thing is like, you know, they're already used to getting incentives and like those kind of, um, uh, um, you know, cash and all those things, which I'm against. So, so I, that's, that's how I felt. And, uh, um, Yes. And do you face that kind of issue when you were asking them to produce things for you? Like they would say, yes, we can produce X amount of goods, but the thing that comes to your mm -hmm. doorstep is different. But not now though. But not now. This, uh, this thing hasn't happened now. Yeah. I mean, uh, they would say, and I, and I, and I, sorry, I always ask them something that they can do. Cause I know, I know what things, uh, uh, are found in that uh, in that place. And first, I I always do a bit more research before I approach them. Though, you know, without without doing a research, I don't approach them because uh, something that you can't do, something that they don't have, and um, you know, you shouldn't expect those things from from other people. You know, first you have to listen to them. You have to be in their footstep, and then only then only like when you approach them, then it's gonna come out good. Yeah, yeah it hasn't happened. Yes. Sorry, go on. Yeah, and then, um, you know, after that, you know, it, it hasn't happened to me. Like, you know, the, uh, that something that can't be done or like, you know, they agree to do it and then later on uh, they would realize like, okay, no, it can't be done. No, sometimes, um, uh, you know, I always, and sometimes what I, uh, what I even tell them is like um, to be in the market, let's say. And, uh, uh, you should come up, you should always uh, add ideas to your things that you have been doing it. Something you have to add some innovations to it, you know? Sometimes people are very sick of using the same thing again. If you add a bit more twist to it, people will appreciate that. And they will like, people love having new things, you know? They just wanted to see some change. And that's what I, sometimes that's what I tell them. Even now, like uh, if, I, if I ask you to make, uh, if we have a new design, and uh, that design can be done. But the thing is like, they haven't done it before. You know, they have been doing the same traditional ones, you know, for many years and they don't want it to change. And I, what I tell them like, look here, you know what? I mean, if there's no demand for it, right? But you have the skill for, an, you, uh, but we have, a, we have something new that we're coming up with and you can do it. You don't need anything different. It's the same thing. It just may be the shape or it might be the size. You know, so that's what I tell. I, I try to convince them, and and they will listen. 
and then when that product when they have done at the end of the day like and uh, end of like when things are over when the things are finished and completed they will be surprised to themselves as well you know so it means like you know um and i even tell them the the feedback of the customers look at this is the, the these people have praised your work and you know they have appreciated your the weaving and it's very strong and and yeah they they love that they love to hear that and they feel very appreciated yeah yeah and one of the things i noticed when i was in nepal that's very unique to you is that it's very very diverse depending where you are you have the mountains you have the lower lands could you give those who are listening who've never been to nepal an idea of what it's like just in nepal and how it's spread out in the communities around the country uh, Nepal being a small country but uh, uh, we are very fortunate to have a diverse uh, uh, geographical reasons um, we have the highest mountain on earth mount everest to the very low lands where it's like very hot in summer and it's a simply plain and uh, uh, each geographical uh, reason has their own speciality and it's, it has its own climate it's the weather condition is uh, very different and uh, and the people who lives in those regions you know they have to um, survive somehow you know and uh, uh, being nepal a very land uh, uh, very remote place like you know we are landlocked we don't have a uh, um, very easy transportations i mean like to get things from from other parts of the world it's not that easy you know the most of the things has to come through land from india and uh, if something happened like you know we all have a, we have to suffer and so it's a bit difficult and the people in nepal somehow managed to survive even in those uh, uh, difficult situations even in mountains like you know mountain they have like uh, uh, the people are more into uh, using woolen items you know and the things that they uh, uh, the hat the jacket the blankets and those all are made from yak wool you know those yak or, or a sheep or or mountain goat you know they have somehow managed to um in, make something that they could fight in those rough conditions and when you come to the mid hills that they're like mid hills is like in between a mountain and and uh, a tarai tarai is like a very warm and plain area and in between mountains and we have a hills and it's mostly covered by uh, a forest and the people living in that region have survived somehow to learn to use those uh, um, forest products. They have learned to make uh, um, use of uh, uh, like uh, the fiber out of uh, like stinging nettle, like hemp or tree bark of a trees and those kind of things, you know. And so they have made a cloth out of it. They have made shoes out of it, and and they have made a, a household goods out of it. So that's the thing. And there's another reason on the on the southern part of Nepal. That's the plain, and it's uh, you have a. Uh, it's also called uh, the uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, um, that's where the, uh, the most of the food grows, like especially the rice and 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 corn and and wheat grows in that this the southern plant because uh, there's an abundance of water there you know the, the river flows from the high hills to the plain and uh, there's a lot of ir irrigation and all these things and uh, so and that that part and that's where the Tharu community lives and um, and because of the river and there are lots of the there are wetland grasses that grows in that part and the people know how to use those grasses if not use will just kind of like you know we just go west or like so these people know how to use those and come up with something very nice baskets or maybe floor mats or even to to cover their houses using those roofs and uh, you know those kind of things and uh, and uh, uh, and so we are very fortunate and uh, and uh, and kolpa as like i think we have identified those uh, the strength and uh, so we're trying to um use those traditional skills local materials and come up with something that satisfy the needs of the global people you know and uh so yeah it's very interesting place and uh yeah having it's it's a this is a 
very nice of as well and and you get to learn so many cultures and and you get to meet people of different uh, 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 lang uh, you know they have their own uh, language as well so yeah it's a, it's it's a mix of everything and and you get to see them in person you get to meet them in person it's very interesting yeah it's yeah. a very interesting place to come yeah and i saw some of the things that you mentioned like the corn husk like the stinging nettle bags that you've been making i saw all these different things presumably made by all these communities would be fair to say that the lives they're leading now is similar to what their ancestors were living like hundreds of years yeah. ago yes yes that's true yeah, there's, uh, suppose let's, um, I'll give an example of a stinging nettle. Um, you know, the, uh, it's a, we call it, a, uh, it's a wild nettle. It grows in the forest here in Nepal. And uh, those plants are like way high above. It's almost like two to three meters tall. And, uh, and what happens is like those, uh, just like hemp, it grows in the, in the, in the forest. Like, and uh, now the nettle, uh, every part of that nettle plant has been used and uh, it, uh, many people have realized that nettle is even the leaf of the nettle now uh, you can find it in the market as a as a tea like a nettle tea or, or you can use that as a soup nettle soup and, and uh, the bark of it you can use this to to make and make it a yarn and, and weave into everything out of it and uh, even the root the root of the uh, nettle plant um, I think it has some medicinal uh, um, uh, benefits you know the people i think for uh, um people with uh, um, diabetic can use it that's what i heard so it is so these are the people and uh and um and nowadays uh, uh those people who are living in that region especially in the remote region in the in somewhere like you know it takes like days to get there uh, in some parts of you know, where, the, where they could find the tons of uh, nettle you know it's very hard for them to come to the market and buy it on top of it's not only about the difficulties to come to the market and buy it but also they don't they don't used to have a money to buy it right they are like self uh, 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 they don't depend on anyone it's they are self-reliant people you know they have their own field they go to the forest and collect timbers and they go to the forest and harvest the nettle and make their own fabric, wear them. And they have their field, they have the cows and, you know, the goats and everything that give them milk and that give them uh, um, um, uh, manure, let's say, to, to, to fertilizer. And so, you know, so, um, so it's uh, the very uh, different and uh, just as the, and they have been doing this for years and years. They don't have to, uh, wait for uh, someone to come and give them money you know it's 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 everything is within their uh, reason so so which is um, so and and that tradition is still kind of like uh, being being uh, uh, being followed and uh, so we we're, we're trying to keep that tradition still alive so yeah, yeah. And one thing you mentioned just now was just, you know, the accessibility of getting things from one place to the other. Could you explain yes. that for you? Because I imagine it must be quite hard to bring those things down from the communities to the city itself, just to sell exactly. it. Exactly, exactly, exactly. You know, first thing is the, is is like um, identifying the product that the people makes is the one part. And then when you know like that product has a value and you know, like when you, uh, when someone from that one, like maybe just a one person from that community knows how to weave that. And like that community is uh, uh, kind of having a very struggle life. You know, everybody in that family like needs to go abroad to earn something. When you, when you know that, when you see them, that's happening. So, and, uh, and if you, when you identify that product is coming from that community, then what we could do is like, maybe we can transfer the skills from one person to another right and market that product bring it here and the bringing is not the difficult part as you said because the thing is the place like we have one nettle drugs and uh it's a, it's a, it's a, a made from organic nettle it's a wild nettle and uh it is uh they are being made in in kali code it's uh it's a it takes like almost like seven to eight hours of uh trade from the nearest um highway bus stations to get to that place and um it's just like you know it's uh when you when you start working at seven in the morning then you reach there by like at least like uh five in the evening or, or yeah it depends like so at least like four or five in the evening. that's that's how 
that's how far it is. And then the, but the people over there makes a very nice drugs. And the, the thing is, um, even after they make those things, it's very difficult for them to carry it and bring it to the nearest bus stations. You know, because the thing is, uh, the people from that region don't know much about like how how logistics works. Like, you know, uh, there are no, some some of the people haven't even gone to the city. They haven't even seen like how the city will looks like. Most of them, some of them, didn't even have a ride a bus. So it's that kind of a thing. So and uh, it's a very difficult and especially and also um, the season will make a big difference. Like during monsoon time, you know, like uh, being in Nepal, a very hilly region, and we have, um, you know, there's always a landslides happening. And uh, suppose, uh, so the, the things that are already made, uh, we can't get them because uh, the roads and, you know, there's a flood and happening there and this, it will be, um, everything will be, um, you know, stopped. And the, so as in a, in a winter season, like we're working with a community from Dolpa and the, uh, uh, Dolpa is like upper Dolpa is we call it the reason behind Himalayas, you know, so you have to go through a lots of um, uh, very difficult uh, um, the mountain pass to get to that uh, place and uh, <clears throat> uh, during winter time uh, we can't uh, get anything from Dolpa, so, so we have to wait for another six to eight months. So when you say going to, through the mountain, you mean that the humans are actually carrying all this from the village all the exactly, way Exactly. Exactly. Human or uh, they use like a mule or a horse or a yak. So those are the only transportations like, you know, to bring those things. It's, it's, we don't have a, um, like, you know, um, the other way of bringing those things. And, uh, and until and unless we, get them where we can't guarantee that, uh, um, you know, even those things are made there, like uh, we can't guarantee that we'll be able to receive that because, you know, because it takes like few days to, to get to the nearest bus stations and uh, you don't know what will happen in between. So, yeah. So it's, so, it's. So how do you do your business then? How do you arrange with say a customer who wants 10 of these balls, but you don't know if the balls will even make it down. So how do you run yeah. it on your end? Yeah, what I would tell our customers, I think our customers know who we are and how we work. So, and uh, I even tell them, I, I, I'm, like to everyone, I, um, I always tell them like how difficult it is to receive things. And uh, so, and, uh, and until and unless we don't receive them here. And I, I always tell them like, we can't commit to your order, you know. But we, we always work hard to, to bring them here. But uh, uh, we can't guarantee them. Sometimes, like you know, even the balls are like suppose the rowdy balls that we were we we have here. Um, they would send me a ten balls if somebody orders a ten ball. They would send me a twenty balls, let's say. And the, but the but but when I receive them, those balls might not be in the same conditions as they were made. They might come cracked. They might got broken because you know they have to go through a very rough time, like. You know, people carry them, putting on the bus, and some people just don't care. They just will just throw the because it's it's all in a sack, in a rice sack, tightly done, and um, and they just you know they don't pay much attention to the uh, um, you know the uh, um, like say uh, the they don't care about like. Yeah, I care about like, you know, the, 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 why do they care? Like, you know, it's just a thing. They will just take that as an object that, that they need to take it to Kathmandu. That's only their thing. So they don't care about like how fragile it is. It might be, it, it may get um, uh, broken or some. They don't care about it. So uh, until now, unless we have those things on our hand, we can't come into our customers. But we tell them that though. And um, uh, the people are very, yeah, they're, they're very considerate. They're very cooperative. They cooperate and they understand our uh, difficulties. And uh, I think that's 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 what the Kolpa is all about. I think you know. So when you understanding receive, when you see these yes. balls and they are cracked, what do you do? Do you just throw them away? No, no, I have I will never throw throw these things away. They are very precious. You know, it's not only about the um, the broken balls. You know, I I always see something some meaningful in it. You know, 
I always see like uh, those balls are made by people who are in a very difficult conditions and uh, they must have made this in a very difficult situations. And uh, it's not easy. It's not like they have a very nice house or that they are not made in a, in a, in a very uh, um, well, uh, um, well made room or something, you know, that it is, it has something that has some story in it. So what I do is like, sometimes I stitch them together. Sometimes I glue them together. And uh, yeah, I will, I will somehow make some use of it and, and try to sell them. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes the broken balls you know, will also be a piece of art as well. You know? So how do you yeah. even begin to learn how to put these different objects together? Yeah, this is, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, I learned from, I do a lot of features and, uh, and uh, just like uh, reusing things, recycling uh, materials, you know, and uh, those are the, the words, term that I, that are, I always follow. And, uh, and also, um, you know, I, I, I do a lot of research like um, from around the world and, and Japanese technique has been a, very inspiration. It, it, it has been a very inspiration to me. I've seen a lot of uh, um, uh, Japanese art um, where people, they don't throw things that are broken or, or, or you know, that are of no use. They somehow come up with some ideas and, 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 and put them together, right? So those are the things that I do. And also, and uh, what I also learn is like from the, when I go to a remote part of Nepal, uh, to a new place, I see them uh, using the same thing for, for years and years. And uh, I see them stitching them together. I see them like fixing somehow, you know? And I was like, wow. I mean, you know, just because it's broken, it doesn't mean that it has to be thrown away. And so I learned from them as well. Cause you know, those people, whoever, I'm especially from Nepal, uh, living in the remote part, they don't have money, or maybe uh, they don't have, they don't get the same thing that uh, um, uh, maybe the person who makes it already passed away, or, or maybe that that product will have some uh, um, you know have a uh, emotional or, or they have some um, connection to it, and and they don't want to throw away. So they, what they do is they try to reuse it. And, and, and make it functional. And that's, that's, that's how I learn. Like, you know, and I ask them like, how do they do it? And, and, and who made it? And, and, and what did you do? Like when it's um, it got destroyed or damaged and, and, you know, I see the way they work and try to learn from them as well. Yeah. And then so come up with something very different. Yeah. And I was wondering, like, apart from meeting with someone like you who would sell them in the city or elsewhere, does the community manage to supplement their income with any other source? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> besides uh, uh, um, making things uh, for us, they are, most of the, uh, the people also have their own uh, field. Like, you know, they have, a, uh, they have their own household stuff. And, uh, this is more of a, like, it's not their full-time job. You know they don't do this. Uh, some of some of them have a cow. Some of them have a buffalo. You know they sell milk, and uh, some of you know some of them have a field, rice field. During harvesting time, they go out in the field, and we don't pressure anyone. You know we 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 always tell them like what we tell them is like after doing all your um, uh, household stuff, like don't stay idle. You know make good use of it, and at least like uh, so that you can. You can keep your skills uh, running, and, and and also you will have something for yourself and your family. You know that's more like an you can have some emergency fund uh, on a side whenever you need it. So that's what I tell them. And then yeah, they will always have some other other major stuff to do, like you know uh, planting, like you know going out in a field, or some has like a, a farm, like a goat farm. Some have a buffalo. Some have cow. Yeah. Not in a big, you know, in a, in a, in a, you know, uh, not as a big farm, but it's more of a, like something that could um, be uh, enough for their families. Yeah. So I want to, I mean, we understand now the communities that you're working with, the challenges that you face working with them. I was wondering, 
for you yourself and Kofa. What was it like when you first started? Wait, did you already have a store somewhere? Like, how did you start going out into the public? Actually, uh, the first time when I uh, finished my website, um, actually, I started from my basement. Actually, I didn't have a store or I didn't have anything. There was my computer and me. And, uh, and uh, there was a basement underneath. And, um, you know, I used to uh, bring fabric and I cut it by myself. I designed everything in there. And then um, I take it to the, uh, the person, the Newar, um, one of my uh, partners from Kirtipur. I, t I used to take it to him and he used to stitch and, and give it to me. That's how, I, how it all started. I didn't have any stores. But the first public, the first time we went uh, to public was on a February uh, 14th of 2015. That was uh, like in 2014, like we met and we developed in a website and there was a bit more buzz going on. Uh, on around the city and then in, uh, um, somebody approached us um, that was a Nepal Young Entrepreneurs Forum it is one of the um, sister organizations of uh, um, men um, of, uh, uh, here the business houses it was a sister organization of one of the uh, the business people and they offered they offered us to showcase our products in that um, uh, February 14th fair it was more of a made in Nepal fair and uh, we we agreed, and uh, that was the first time that we went on public, and uh, and everybody started asking us like uh, where our stories, and you know, and uh, where where are, where do we sell them? And then I was kind of like I don't know what to say then because I didn't have any store, or I don't have anywhere, any any like physical location where they come and buy it, or I haven't kept this to any i haven't given it to any other store as well to sell my product so everything was done online everything was um yeah, in my apartment and then and after that i realized like okay i think i, sh I should have a uh, uh, some store where people could co come and buy things and and or at least like come and see it in person so yeah and the first one was after that um, like subsequently maybe after a few months we started our first store in Lazim Park in Kathmandu. And what other products were you selling at the time in Lazim Park? That time it was a bag and, uh, you know, the store, it, just, it was just a cotton bag and, uh, and uh, you know, the store looks kind of empty, like, you know, just, just having like few, maybe I had only like 10 different bags and, uh, and um, so it was more, I, I actually designed that bag to sell abroad and uh, I didn't feel like, because when you are uh, starting a business here, you have to sustain, right? From the market that's, from the local market. And uh, so it was quite difficult for me. <clears throat> and then I started keeping things, actually. This is the one I, I started working, uh, uh, um, like Nepali paper, Lokta paper. Uh, yeah, and then there was some, yeah, the same, the grass straw mats straw mats the one from uh, from southern nepal from taru communities and uh, there were some woolen items as well and it was not my design though it wasn't my design i just wanted to fill the space so that uh, you know when people come to the store if they are not interested in bags they might find some other stuff they can take so yeah so what was the Those reception what was the reception like? Were the products flying off the shelves and you could keep up with them? Not really, actually. T to be honest with you, first few years was very tough for me. And uh, actually, I had to even pay my rent from my own pocket. Yeah, so, and uh, it wasn't self-sustaining. Maybe it's because of the location as well, because we were on the first floor. And, uh, and also, the uh, that time that area was under construction the roads were kind of like dusty and you know so they were kind of like widening the uh, uh, the streets and uh, there was always constructions happening and uh, uh, but uh, uh, it didn't go that well though the first few years was was a bit tough yeah so how do you manage in terms of finances because you still need to feed yourself while pursuing this yes that's where uh, my other half comes in, you know, she, she started, that's where um, she steps in and, uh, you know, we are living a very simple life. We're still living a very simple life. We don't, um, we don't, uh, um, we only thing we want is like, you know, uh, a good sleep, 
is I think that's all we are. That's that's what we all want, and uh, we want we want our kids to have a good education. That's that's our main goal. The rest is like you know we we can survive, and then the, during those hard days, my difficult days, my my wife was uh, supporting my family as well. So yeah. so from the earning that she made, uh, she was supporting me and my 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 kids as well. So and my for the business, uh, uh, my parents um helped me a little yeah as well so yeah first few years was more of a learning and i think um those difficult days were the i think are now my strength you know mm -hmm. if i could even hold uh in such a period then i think um yeah these days is like you know the covid and whatever i don't i don't see it that tough i everybody thinks it's a tough time but um i think i've gone through that already did you ever feel during those periods that maybe you wanted to give up and not pursue this line just get like a job that would be yes good? yeah actually you know sometimes it comes in because you know um, when you have a lot of expenses then your earnings and when you when you seeing yourself sinking right and then when you look back and like uh, Sometimes I, I regret of coming to Nepal. That period, you know, those days, because uh, and and I and I and I, you know, that's where I think uh, where this education comes in. Like, if I was a business uh, uh, graduate, maybe you know, I could have some ideas. You know, maybe I could go and look for investors or, or, or trying to write a project, the business plan and look for a business loan and those kind of things. But I'm, I wasn't good at anything. I was just doing something that is uh, uh, coming out of my uh, my heart. You know, I wasn't thinking of going big or like something like that. And I, an only goal that time was like how to survive. Right. And that time, sometimes, sometimes I regret, like, you know, even I used to tell my wife, you know, I think, uh, hey, you know, I think we made a bad decision coming to Nepal. I think we should go back to U.S. But she said, no, I mean, come on. I mean, whatever you're doing is doing something good. I mean, maybe not today, maybe after after a few weeks or maybe a month or so. Right. And only she used to, um, you know, encourage me to to look to the to the brighter side. And because uh, even even those difficult times, I have seen so many people coming to our store, and 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 sharing me uh, 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 sharing me kind and good words. Then you know, people used to appreciate the thing that we make, and and those few words were kind of like you know, uh, kind of like holding me tight. So yeah, but yeah, sometimes it it kind of comes. It used to come to me. Like, uh, I, I don't know, why should I, why did I step into the business? Maybe I should have just go and do some kind of like nine to five job. But uh, uh, yeah, so I think it happens to everyone once in a while, especially when you were uh, uh, doing something new, something different. Yeah, for sure. And I'm wondering at one, what point did it, all the fortunes turn and you feel that, okay, you can make it? You know what? Yeah, sometimes like I have a few customers like even in those difficult times, like those customers used to come to me and those customers are not something like, like simple people, like, you know, they are like uh, very elite people and uh, we have, uh, um, you know, sorry. And uh, uh, they're very elite, elite people and uh, they're, you know, they have a very high social status. And some people were from, uh, from abroad as well. And when they come to me and when they see me, when they see our products, you know, they used to take everything from us. And yeah, and like, I still have a, you know, there was a time uh, I felt like, you know, my store has gone almost empty, just like one customer steps in. After one, uh, when she was there, like she took almost everything and like, like and then I was like, what, what am I gonna sell afterwards, you know? And it means like, and what I felt is like, there's something in this the thing I'm doing must have something. Otherwise, why does, why would she come and, and take everything what I have? So, and, uh, and there was another time, like someone from Korea came in and uh, at that time I was just starting making backpacks, making nettle and handmade leather. And then uh, that I just started making samples actually. 
and uh it was just uh i just made like one or two because i wasn't i have i, I didn't have uh, money to afford to make like 10 backpacks then you know so i used to only make like two or three pieces like if i sell those then i'm just gonna go and make another one that, that kind of thing that that my the first uh <clears throat> the beginning days and the guy came in and he was asking even for the samples like look here i'm gonna take this to to south korea and i'm gonna sell this and he took almost like everything and that means so and uh he was uh he was an, a social media influencer actually and uh, he see the markets there. He saw, yeah, I don't know. He saw the markets there and he goes like, there's a market for it. You know what? And then I was like, okay. So yeah, so those few peoples, because of them, I felt like there must be something in it. And then um, I should keep going. At what point did you yeah. feel that you were out of the difficult patch? Was there a turn, particular turning point for you? Yeah, like when I started, uh, um, you know, we moved from... Um, Lazimpat to Jamsikhel, the place where I, the, not, the place no. where you are, yeah, we are right now. And uh, and we also started going to a different fairs, like especially a market fairs like Christmas. Uh, there used to be a Christmas fair and used to be a holiday fairs every Saturday, you know, in, in different parts of Nepal, in Kathmandu, there used to be a, the holiday markets happening. And I, I used to take part in almost every market fair then because I just need like the, uh, uh, our words to be out there you know i would just want people to see like we exist you know and then you know when people started it's like you know oh i have like you know the, the people started telling us like how good our product oh i'm giving this to i'm sending this to someone who's looking for this kind of thing for so many years and those kind of things and and when you started getting a very good response especially in the fair market then we realized like okay i think we have gone through the, those difficult times. And, and when we moved back to here, in, when we came to Zamskel, and then the things were just, yeah, it was such a, uh, you know, we kind of like, uh, it's not like a walking and running. We actually started jumping. And it what was year more was of a this? leap. What year that was, was that like, uh, uh, I think 2017. Yeah. Yeah, 2017, 2018, like, yeah. It's been such a great year. Amazing. Yeah. And since 2017, how has it been so far? So far, it's such a like, it's such a blessing we feel. Yeah, it's been such like, it's not from uh, within Kathmandu, not, it's not only from Nepal. We are getting a lot of inquiry from around the world. And everybody, most of them like inquiries are like from uh, people who are like environmentally aware and uh, who, who wants to have a, um, buy things from uh, um, from a business like us, some are like who are uh, doing some uh, work, uh, I mean, uh, impacting, giving some positive change to the society. And those are the people we are, we are getting more inquiry from. And so, yeah, it's been, it's not only from, it's not only about the Nepal, it's also from around the globe that we're, we're getting, uh, the Kolpa is getting uh, um, kind of like buzz. And how do people yeah. tend to find out about Kolpa? I think mostly from the websites and also from social media. And also from word of mouth, the people like uh, from here who buy things from here, they go back home and then, uh, you know, uh, maybe they may, maybe the Kolpa products might be a, uh, it must have been a conversation starter and they just look look to the, uh, you know, they just go and search. And that's how people find from websites and also from social media. Yeah. And I think it's clear from your entire story that, you know, it's really, it's not like typical business, what you're doing. Kopa is a social enterprise. And just bear in mind those who might not know what that means. Could you explain what your understanding of a social enterprise is? Yeah, for me, uh, social enterprise is something that, you know, uh, where uh, it's more of a, it's a business with a service, you know, and uh, uh, Business in the sense that, um, you know, when you were doing um, business, you have to sustain yourself as well, but, but not putting the money first, you know. So whatever, uh, when, you, when your business is growing, what I feel is like when, when your business is growing, you have, to, you have to take along your partners along with you, you know. Whoever are in the process, 
like when you're running a business, whoever are in the process, like suppose it could be a, um, besides Kolpa, we have lots of partners from different uh, regions of Nepal. And also we have uh, 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 the makers as well. And also who are uh, the, the producers of raw materials. They all have to progress at the same time. You know, that's how I feel. So when you are, uh, uh, it's not the Kolpa, it's, it's not only about the Kolpa that's growing every day. It's also the life of the people you're working with. They should also grow along with you. Can that's you what I feel. And, can you but, give an example? And, yeah, sure. And also, and also without, having a, without giving a negative impact to the society and the environment. That's the, you know. So uh, those are the things that you should consider. Suppose like, uh, uh, let me just give you an example from the Tharu community that we are working with, who are kind of hesitate to come to the, even to the training. And, but uh, luckily, you know, like we have such a, uh, the, the, so we, we all had such a good time. I, I still remember like, you know, when we started, when they are um, selling that mat, mat for like 1200 rupees and so, and uh, now the price has like almost like a double now. You know, it's doubled on top of that. It's not only about the price of the thing that they are making. It's also about the, you know, um, the impact they have uh, given to the society. Now it's not only one people who are doing this. You know, let me just give you one example of, uh, uh, we, we, we used to make a, we still, we're still making it. It's a small stool. It's a sitting stool and it's uh, uh, woven by the same grass that uh, that they usually find in there in that uh, uh, Tharu um, uh, they're made by the Tharu people but the, you know it's in the same region their locality it's a grass it's a like wetland grass and uh, you know we're, we're you know I've been working with uh, uh, the mother you know the, the mother one who weaves this and the father used to make the uh, inside uh, of the frame of the stool and the mother used to weave around the uh, the stool and 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 give it a final very nice and fine look and then uh, seeing that their daughter started you know joining them and now the daughter and her uh, son in law are kind of helping her now now they, they are like four people right and also looking at that Looking at the women's, uh, uh, you know, her like sending so many um, the woven stool to Kathmandu, the other people from that community are also started making stools now. And the thing is, there was one time I called uh, the lady who I work with, mother, and then the, she was telling me her daughter wants to speak to me. And then, then uh, you know, she, she goes like, I really wanted to speak to Ravi sir. And just wanted to say something, some, uh, just wanted to speak to him. I just wanted to hear her, hear his voice. That's what she told me. And I was like, okay, I mean, you know, that is called impact, you know, showing some, giving some impact. I, I think uh, now, now she's, uh, it's not only about like one family. Now it's about like five other different families that uh, we made an impact to. So, yeah. and the demand for that, demand for that stool is like growing every day. Yeah. Do you have a particular community that has especially touched you? Uh, yes, actually, Rauti community, the one who made the, uh, the wooden balls. Um, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> Rautas are the last nomads of Nepal and uh, they're hunter gatherers. They don't live in one, but they don't have a home. They move from place to place. And uh, only skills they have is like making wooden uh, bowls and uh, wooden chest, right? And those, um, those things. And they have been doing this for like generations, like hundreds of years. And, uh, um, uh, and, and that community has... Uh, um, you know, there are only 145 to 150 of them left. And the uh, only thing they could survive is by making these uh, balls and trading them with grains and the clothings and stuff like this. And uh, they don't uh, ask for more. They don't ask for, uh, you know, anything beyond the food they could survive on, right? very they don't ask for like they don't have a high hopes they don't have ambitions they just wanted to live every day those are the people i'm working with and uh and uh what i felt is like um if we don't encourage them to keep doing what they're doing those crafts will be lost and even the whole community will be extinct 
So yeah, these are uh, the router people are the ones like who I'm really tasked with, and I really wanted to do something. And I think uh, uh, it's, it's not bad. We're doing okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're doing pretty good with them. Yeah, we're getting along. And I'm wondering, um, you mentioned about these people who are very dependent on the climate and with demand and supply. So how has COVID-19 impacted the community and COPA itself? Yes, um, you know, uh, before COVID-19, like uh, um, we have a uh, Visit Nepal 2020 was, was about to run, right? And uh, uh, like everybody was getting ready for Visit Nepal 2020 and even us, we we're kind of uh, getting ready for that. So we, we have uh, uh, stocked a lot of items so that, because uh, we know that uh, uh, many people would come in and, and visit us. So before COVID-19, um, before COVID-19, um, you know, uh, we had a, a lot of things from Taru community, from Rauti community, even from the people, from the inmates who makes our, uh, the, even we are working with the prisoners as well. And uh, so um, whatever we have in stock, you know, uh, slowly, like after this uh, um, lockdown got loose, lockdown is kind of like, you know, we're kind of like the things are going, uh, coming back to normal now. And uh, whatever we have stocked in those days, pre-COVID-19, we're selling them out quite fast, which is good for us. But to the community who we are working with, they're having a hard time sending those goods to us, you know, because uh, the transportation is not allowed to run from one district to another. So whatever happens, whatever ha happens only within certain part of, uh, of that district. It could only within the district, not, not from the other regions of Nepal. So like uh, we still have the, um, the furnitures made by the prisoners uh, from Dai Lake, from Karnali region. We haven't been able to receive that. You know, uh, they have made that like three months ago. And uh, same with the Tharu community. You know, uh, during lockdown, they have nothing to do, so, so they just stay home and, and weave, the, weave things um, from, you know, that we have ordered. And the same with the stools, you know, it's still sitting there and, and they haven't been able to uh, send us here. So COVID-19 has kind of like, I'm kind of worried about um, um, the, the production the production of the product have been like kind of stopped right now because, uh, uh, um, because, you know, uh, but what we have been doing is like, uh, if they couldn't sub, uh, send any things, but if they need money, we have been sending them though, you know, we haven't kept them on like, okay. Um, cause I know like those three months have been very difficult, but uh, uh, if they need anything, because uh, the people we work with are like, mostly like, you know, they weave it today, they send it to us, they expect us to pay right away. So we know that, you know, how difficult their life is. So, and uh, without any uh, question or anything, even I ask them like, if they're okay with the, uh, if they're doing okay with the, with the amount they have, are they having difficulties, uh, you know, supporting their family? If you are, just let me know. And I even supported them without any clause or anything, without any conditions, because I know them, you know, they are, because uh, um, we are partners. So at difficult times, we have to help each other out. That's what we think. But the thing is like the, you know, most of our products are, are like uh, the people from other parts of the world when they visit us, they wanted to take a piece of Nepal. And now because of COVID-19, you know, we have a completely uh, um, um, stopped or say like having any, 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 any tourists in, in, in Nepal. And so the biz tourism business has completely gone down. So, and uh, we will have a, uh, the flow has been kind of very less less but uh, we are kind of like thinking of going online though let's see how it goes uh, but uh yeah the sales has been i mean it's not like um, um it's not something that we uh you know hoping for uh things are kind of slow but um, um i still don't have a complaint about it you know because the many business are having a much more um, tougher time than us so thinking about them uh, we're we're okay we're okay but hopefully you know, even in the coming days, we'll have the same thing. 
but uh, let's let's hope so. Let's so hope will, for the better times. So, will people from other parts of the world be able to buy from you now? Like people in Malaysia can just go to Kopa and order something. Yes, they could, but the thing is, like the uh, the shipment cost would be a bit more high. So that's what I'm a bit more hesitated to, like you know, from like if somebody wants to order from kolpaworld.com, they could order it. But uh, uh, here, the international flight has been uh, completely stopped, and uh, uh, there's a uh, shipment is happening only on a chartered flight, and uh, they are charging us like um, uh, extra um, emergency fee. So, and uh, so that's what I'm worried about. If somebody wants to like order in a bulk, uh, uh, that won't be a problem. But if it's something like single items or, you know, a few products, um, uh, the cost would be a bit more higher, but still people could order it. But from and right now, um, I have uh, disabled the, uh, uh, the ordering feature uh, on our site uh, because of uncertainty of this, um, uh, the charter flight, because, uh, charter flight doesn't happen very often so yeah so you know when people are paid for the product they expect it to be arrived soon or like you know so which i can't guarantee right now so i'm holding that for a while but for if somebody wants to order in a bulk we can definitely do that that won't be a problem so at this point in time what do you think is the future for copa uh, for us, it's more about um, extending the market of Kolpa is one thing. And another is like, uh, we have to work on a business model here within the country, within Nepal. We wanted to have a network of, uh, um, of our partners from different regions of Nepal into one so that they can share the skills and information among one another. That is one of our goals right and make it more the production process uh, to make the production process more efficient right and so another one is to how to uh, bring those pro market those those product to the global audience that is another part and uh, and uh, and we are hoping to have a, a, our um, store or or, uh, or or collaborate with some other uh, uh, the store from from outside Nepal, that is our another goal. That's that's our objectives because the um, these products are um, has a demand for demand everywhere. I mean that's how I feel. These are purely like you know uh, uh, the natural, organic. It's handmade and doesn't harm the earth and environment, and it's made very social and, and we are being very responsible in making. So uh, it has a whole lot of um, story behind it. And uh, I think uh, the people, whoever buys our product will, have, will always feel good about it. It's not only about the, uh, that they spend money on certain, uh, you, certain product, they also feel good about it when spending money on them. So this is more, so we're, so we're um, thinking of ex extending and looking for or, or collaborate with the partners from from outside Nepal as well. That is our another goal, and then uh, we're trying to um, to uh, go for an online store here in Nepal as well, because uh, we have we have seen a lot of interest. Uh, even uh, the people within Nepal, it's not only for outside, even within Nepal, because uh, I think that is must for Nepal now, because uh, uh, Nepal has been importing a lot of uh, goods from uh, from other countries, and uh, all of you know. So to have a self-sustained economy, I ha we have to make aware the people here in Nepal to use something that is produced and made here. Yeah. And I'm wondering, so this, this, that is, this is something we haven't covered yet, which is um, when people buy something, what happens with <clears throat> that money? Like how do you portion what goes to community and what? Community, okay. Yeah, most of the, like, uh, to uh, um, you know, um, to the people who makes it, like almost 50% of our money, uh, money goes to the community. Whatever is the sell price here, the so 50% of them goes to the uh, goes to the community, and the um, and uh, um, and also the uh, the community at the. We also have a um, uh, uh, have a plan like that. We have a. It's not a plan. We have already implemented it. And uh, we're also giving them, suppose, let's say to the Rauti people, like they are the nomads, right? So when they make things for, when they make things, 
and uh, uh, they will send it here through one organization and uh, that organization will put the price of the product right and then uh, we pay the whatever the amount that they have asked for and that organization will uh, buy things for them right so that's uh, and uh, so that's the case and and uh, we do a bit more finishing to the product and and put a price on it and after selling their products we put aside certain amount of money money to so that like whenever the routing needs something like maybe sometimes uh, they will have a difficulties when they have to move from one place to another or sometimes during monsoon time they will always have a difficulty in in and keeping stories of the grains and stuff they always have a hard time and also during winter time they will have a, uh, a difficulty especially having a warm clothes right so during those times we use that fund from after selling their product we use that fund to, to support back. We, that we, we give back to the community as well. And the same with the Taru community, what we have been doing is like, uh, we wanted to encourage people to, to, uh, to make things. And, uh, and uh, we have a, uh, we, there is a, um, there's a scheme, let's say. What we do is like, if, if a certain weaver, if, if a certain weaver with certain amount of uh, uh, um, the floor mats, maybe let's say, a 200 square uh, feet of uh, uh, floor mats. So what we, um, uh, besides getting her, uh, the money for her woven mat finished product, what we give them, what we give them is like, uh, we ask them the need in their household. Like, okay, what do you need? Something that could make, you, make their life easy. Like since we're working with the community, sometimes they need a, a rice cooker, something they might need a pressure cooker, sometimes they need a solar light, sometimes they need a transistor or radio or something, or maybe something, some other stuff, right? We are maybe a fan, because uh, the way that the way they are staying is like well, kind of warm. So maybe they might need a heater, right? So we ask them what the need is, and then uh, we give them to the, to the people who, who have like woven certain amount of uh, um, certain area of uh, floor mats, we send them their um, the, the the award. That's like you know, so that the people uh, when other other person sees them receiving those like you know just weaving the floor mats, right? And it that would be that would encourage other people to also maybe you know what maybe I should be a bit more serious as well. Maybe I should so that you know. That is also kind of like, besides earning something, they're getting as a reward. So that's what we do as well. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, most of the 50% of the, um, yeah, most of 50, more than 50% sometimes goes back to the community. Amazing. And looking back, is there anything that you would have done differently with all the experience you have now? You know, uh, yeah, you know, what I feel is like, maybe I should have invest, invested a little more on it, you know, so that, because um, the experience that I have, until now and uh, um, you know and the uh, the people I have met with what I felt is like um, if I would have invested a bit more amount in it like you know in a bit more capital if I would invest a bit more capital in it I would have you know um, uh, impact you know more uh, like if I would have like you know in, 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 in the form of uh, let's say uh, um, if I would have spent more money on giving a training, let's say, right? Training to, uh, from one community to another community. For that, to, to give also a training, you need, you need money. You need, you, you need to have some um, cash in hand, right? So, and, uh, um, uh, if, so I wish I could have done that, but I think uh, slowly, because uh, since I'm just running things on my own and uh, uh, it's a bit more difficult to manage time. And, uh, but, um, you know, I wish I could have have a, like a few more other partners, or let's say, uh, like you know, so that uh, uh, yeah, if if that would have been, then it would have been a much more bigger. The culpa would have been much more bigger than the, what we have right now. I think it's the experience that is uh, taught, that I'm you know I've been through, and I'm, so that that's what I'm talking right now. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, but I think uh, we'll get there. But at the moment, uh, I wish I could have done it in a much more bigger scale. That's it would it would have a bigger impact. 
For those who are looking to be a social entrepreneur themselves, do you have any big piece of advice for them? What I would say to, to everyone uh, who wanted to do business, but in a very socially responsible way, what I want them to is like, never put your interest first, right? And, and uh, you know, what I feel is like, uh, you just go for the, go for the guts that you have. Like, you know, if you, if you, if you wanted to serve community, think that community first, always put your uh, feet on their shoes and then do the backwards calculations in such a way that both person will have a mutual benefits, right? And so that the both, both partners will grow together. That's what I would tell to everyone. Like, you know, like there's a business, but it, do a business in such a way so that the whoever you are working with will grow the same ratio or in the same way that you are growing. So that's all. Great. Thank you so much, Ravi, for your time. I normally end with three quick questions, which is, do you feel that you have found your why? I kind of like, you know, I'm not sure about this. I don't know why I did it, you know, this thing, but uh, uh, but I'm still needs to. There's still a long way to go. There's still a long way to go. So um, uh, until now, I said I would say that I haven't found why on it because uh, I haven't. I feel like you know, even though like there are like um, five or six communities that I'm working with, what I feel is like that's not enough for me. That is, this is not the. Uh, um, um, this is not the time to calculate myself or to evaluate myself that I'm being successful it's because there's a long way to go. So, um, so I still haven't like, you know, uh, what I'm doing is just a, just the gut feeling that I have, you know, the, uh, the feeling to serve people. That's the only thing I'm, I'm, I'm doing right now, but to find uh, uh, why is uh, still, I still have a long way to go. To what, find that meaning. And what kind of legacy would you like to leave behind? You know, I would all, like since the beginning, like um, I always say, like I wanted to um, leave a space where no one can fill up. Wow. That's and um, what are the most important qualities of someone who wants to do what you're doing? It's uh, uh, patience. And, uh, And also, um, it's a politeness, patience, politeness, and uh, thinking beyond self. And if anyone wants to connect with you, know what Kopa is up to, what's the best way for them to reach out? Yeah, they could. Uh, well, we have a, a Kulpa World. Um, uh, we have a Facebook page, and we also have a Instagram uh, Kulpa World. They could they could um, direct message me, or they could even email me uh, uh, through my uh, through my websites or, or, or from my email address. And uh, yeah, we have a WhatsApp. Uh, we have our own WhatsApp number. They can they can contact me through WhatsApp as well. Yep. Yeah. So I'll put all those links Many. in the show notes so people can reach out to you. Is there yes. anything else in this very long conversation that you feel we haven't covered that people should know? Um, I think, uh, um, you know, things are very different. I mean, because uh, maybe so many uh, people around the world might be listening to this. Uh, being in Nepal is a, it's a different scenario. Maybe uh, it might be easy for the uh, uh, the people living in, in one country and maybe it might uh, it may be much more difficult to people listening in some other countries but the only thing you know when you wanted to do something good for the society or when you wanted to start a social uh, business is like uh, uh, you should have a patience first you should always have a patience because especially when you're working with community you have to be in the as I said you have to be who they are and, uh, and, uh, and the building relationship is the foremost thing. It's not about the uh, creating products or, or building product. It's more about the building relationship and the, the gaining trust. And uh, once you have that, the product will automatically be created. You know, it's not a big deal. It's not about the product. It's more about the relationship. That's what I would tell everyone. 
Amazing, Robbie. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Link. Thank you.